Hello, I'm Wes Weimer, and this talk is entitled From Deep Learning to Human Judgments, Lessons for Genetic Improvement. And over the course of the next 45 minutes, I'm going to be talking about what I think is a fairly interesting new subject and one that I hope will spark a bit of discussion. There are rumors of an existential crisis in program repair and program improvement related to a recent surge in the use of deep learning or machine learning or language or neural network models being applied to program repair or improvement or summarization tasks. This talk is going to provide a gentle introduction to those topics, some of their uh, advantages and some of the concerns we have associated with them. And <clears throat> because we're presenting to a wide audience, uh, I'm going to cover a bit of, of background material. Some of you may already be familiar with it. Um, <clears throat> if you are, I'm hoping that in the, the chat or the subsequent discussion, feel free to just comment on, on something that would benefit from additional elaboration. I think we'd really benefit from a vigorous discussion here. I'm going to start by providing a summary of some of the recent advances, focusing on some of the better known um, <clears throat> techniques based on generative pre-trained transformers. And then I'm going to talk about a number of concerns that researchers and practitioners in the community have raised, including things like the potentially exclusionary cost of training, the challenges associated with generating truly novel code using these approaches, the very problem statement or sort of situation uh, in which these techniques are applied, and then a potential mismatch in how we evaluate these techniques across disciplines and how we talk about whether or not they're succeeding. After that, I'm going to make some recommendations for things we could do differently, either on the, the research side, maybe including some additional human studies with deception or eye tracking or some algorithmic changes, maybe involving grammars or fault localization. Maybe also things we can do as a community, how we treat certain topics in program committee meetings or on panels. At the end, I'll talk a bit about some of the recent industrial deployments of program repair and improvement and look at some of the commonalities they have and how that might focus our collective research efforts on activities that are most likely to have an impact in the real world. So <clears throat> to get started, there's been an increasing use of techniques that were traditionally associated with artificial intelligence and machine learning, and even natural language processing. Things like neural networks or language models or machine translation approaches being applied to program repair and improvement and summarization and testing sorts of problems. And as a result, researchers from other non-AI backgrounds, maybe the ones we might be familiar with in this audience, evolutionary computing, software engineering, programming languages, have expressed significant concerns. And I've heard from people serving on program committees, people who are, are co-authors with me on papers, as well as non-collaborators, people from multiple countries, um, <clears throat> that this is something that's been on their minds. PC members, for example, might suggest, oh, if you've been on the program committee for a recent venue, you might have been given you know, half a dozen or a dozen of these machine learning meets program repair papers and asked to sort of evaluate them. And <clears throat> a common sentiment, rephrased here informally, but not exaggerated too much, is a concern that these AI techniques will descend upon us like a plague of locusts, uh, that they'll sort of, uh, you know, eat all of the nearby food and convince everyone, program committees, grant managers, that genetic improvement, program repair, these are just other problems that can be defeated by the well-studied hammer of AI and machine learning and neural networks, and that after having you know, sort of demonstrated some success, they will move on uh, to a new problem domain, unfortunately leaving the field fallow after that. And that's a, you know, it's a, that's a bit hyperbolic or that's concerning, but that is the sort of sentiment I've heard expressed from people at conferences or in private communication. And so <clears throat> when faced with this sort of fear, uncertainty and doubt, I think it's important to separate out sort of natural human reactionary resistance to change 
versus a more nuanced critique. And if we've been doing something one particular way for a long time and someone suggests a revolutionary change to it, it is perhaps human nature to be resistant. We should strive not to be, but it's perhaps understandable. Um, <clears throat> but we want to separate out uh, that notion from legitimate concerns with these approaches. For example, if these deep learning neural network language model approaches really do entirely solve our problems, then we should be happy about that, even if that means that some of our techniques are obviated if they become yesterday's news. But that encourages us to consider the question, do these new techniques actually entirely solve the problem we've been thinking about? And there are a number of common critiques that I want to bring up and delve into in more detail. One relates to the problem formulation itself. A lot of these machine learning, deep learning AI approaches assume perfect fault localization, that you know exactly the place in the program to change to improve it or fix a bug. Another common concern relates to assessment and evaluation. A lot of these approaches use internal metrics uh, that may not speak to uh, the utility of the produced patches or improvements in a software engineering context. There are also a number of potential foundational limitations associated with the current generation of uh, AI algorithms being applied, most notably that uh, in a, a sort of a, a tricky sense that I'll go into in more detail, they lack the ability to synthesize truly novel patches. And then <clears throat> sort of finally, but something I might go into uh, fairly early on, there are moral accessibility concerns about the very high monetary cost of making use of these techniques. They require very extensive pre-training of models that might exclude participation from uh, researchers or, or community members with less resourced backgrounds. So, as an example of, of what I think is a more uh, nuanced or, or balanced phrasing of, of these sorts of concerns, I have a quote from uh, Abek at the National University of Singapore. It's most recently associated perhaps with the Concolic Program Repair Tool, but is very well known for being involved in the hugely influential Semfix and Angelix uh, semantics-based repair approaches. And he notes, the rise of language models raises many interesting connections. At the most basic or unit level, there's a dire need to improve the code generated by language models like Codex. We'll talk about Codex in a minute. There's a need to understand the kind of semantic errors that lurk in such auto-generated code. There's a value in proposing analysis or fixing mechanisms specifically for auto-generated code. However, there's the opportunity to expand on these prompts to capture the power of program synthesis. Program synthesis or programming by example approaches differ from language model-based approaches primarily in the ability to synthesize code which was never seen before. And we're going to return to a lot of the issues raised there, including this notion of you know, novelty and synthesis, but I wanna get started with one of the things mentioned early. What does this mean, language models like Codex? Well, OpenAI's Codex is a generative pre-trained transformer. For our purposes, that's the, the name of a sort of an algorithm class uh, from artificial intelligence or machine learning. It's a GPT approach in which a neural network based on a deep learning model is trained on an enormous corpus of text. And these sorts of algorithms and their training are a, a huge engineering effort. Uh, the paper with 30 plus authors hints at some of that, and we'll go more into the, the scale and the size in a bit. But the positive bit is that these approaches when applied to natural language text can produce prose with human equivalent fluency. You might imagine an experiment in which there are sort of real news articles produced by humans, and then also synthetic news articles produced by this sort of approach. And you might ask people, can you tell the difference or which is which? And humans might not be able to distinguish the prose produced by this sort of algorithm from the prose produced by an actual human. And that sounds super compelling. You might not have heard of <clears throat> a GPT per se, but an example application of it that uh, is making sort of increasing waves on the software engineering side is GitHub Copilot. 
which is advertised as, you know, sort of your support for AI pair programming. In practice, there's less pair programming, but there's a significant amount of AI. And as the illustration on the right suggests, you start writing some code or maybe a comment, and then it does very significant uh, code completion, filling in sort of huge amounts of code for you uh, based on the natural language cues in the, the prompt you've provided. And so beyond natural languages like English or Hindi, these sorts of models can be trained and applied to source code like Python or C++. Now, using natural language processing techniques on code at scale from a research perspective is not new. And there's a great line of research you know, on the naturalness of software, the uniqueness of software that would apply you know, n-gram models to really, really large corpuses and suggest that there's a regularity uh, you know, that can be exploited in the programs written by humans. But I'm going to claim, um, even if the general notion of applying NLP to code is not new, the way in which it's playing out now, the interest in it, the scale, the scope, does feel new. And so <clears throat> one example of that is the transcoder technique from Facebook AI research. It uses one of these uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence transformer approaches and encoder decoder architecture to translate source code between languages. Like you give it a program in Python, it will give you back program in C++ that does the same thing. That predates the emphasis on codecs. Uh, but its specific uh, focus on notions like readability or how it evaluates its results is going to make it very relevant for genetic improvement or program repair. And so I'm going to return to, to discuss it uh, quite a bit. But initially, it might seem like, I don't know, is this relevant? This is a you know, genetic improvement workshop. Why are you talking about uh, language translation? But it turns out that we now have all of the building blocks to apply this sort of thing directly to program repair or program improvement. One good example of this is a very popular uh, coconut uh, project and paper that uses AI and deep learning, but views program repair as a translation problem from buggy to correct source code. You can see this as early as the keywords in their paper, automated program repair, deep learning, neural machine translation, AI. Uh, and they sort of say this very directly, that APR can be seen as translation from a buggy to correct source code, and therefore it's an opportunity to apply neural machine translation. And it posts very strong results, fixing over 500 bugs, including over 300 not fixed by 27 other baseline techniques across four different languages. And papers like Coconut, I think, really caught the attention of a lot of people in the community. Like, this is a really cool result. Uh, you know, could I get in on that? Should we be using some of these techniques? Let's learn more about that. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there are a number of concerns with using these sorts of language-based models in practice, and I want to go through a few of them in turn. One of them, this is, this is sort of more neutral, but it's going to end up being an issue, is that in these approaches, the training is critical to their success. Training large models from big data sets really matters. And the original GPT paper, the sort of AI and machine learning papers, are not shy about this. Uh, in their paper, they note, we show that scaling up language models like to bigger data sets greatly improves task agnostic performance, sometimes even reaching competitiveness with prior state of the art. And there's a lot of sort of jargon in that from the AI or machine learning side, but very informally, I might say, this means that a model trained on a large enough corpus is going to match or maybe even outperform approaches specialized to specific tasks. So if last year you thought very hard and wrote a genetic improvement approach based on sort of a novel algorithm, the next year someone could come along and take a generic GPT-3 model, train it on an even larger corpus, and show higher empirical performance. And to many researchers in the domain, uh, something about that feels unsettling. Although in an official sense, that is the, the promise of the machine learning revolution. Now, <clears throat> if it were just that the training was, you know, mattered, but was beneficial, that would be less of a concern. But in practice, an additional issue is that the training is very expensive. GPT-3, one of these algorithms was, or models, was trained on 50 times more data than its predecessor, GPT-2, 
600 gigabytes, resulting in a model with 175 billion parameters. That's not the sort of thing you're going to be doing on a local laptop. GPT-J was trained on an even larger 800 gigabyte data set. GitHub is, is a little coy about uh, exactly what Copilot was trained on, or at least I wasn't able to find it. Uh, but they do indicate that it was trained on billions of lines of code, and a uh, line of code typically has at least one character on it. The Codex paper uh, notes this training cost, this expensiveness, very directly. First, Codex is not sample efficient to train. The original training of GPT-3 consumed hundreds of petaflop second days of compute time. Now that's a sort of a complicated phrasing, uh, but you can imagine you could measure the speed of a computer in like you know millions of instructions per second or petaflops per second. And then if you're buying time on a cloud computing resource like Amazon AWS, you know if you have one of those computers running for a day, that's you know one computer petaflop second per day. <clears throat> and so what they're suggesting is that it's taking uh, you know hundreds of days of very fast, uh, you know, uh, computer time that they had to rent in the cloud. And they say fine tuning it to create, you know, slightly better model consumed a similar amount of compute time. And they even note in their paper, like this was important enough for them to bring up that the training was performed on a platform that produces, that purchases carbon credits to offset the cost to the environment of the, you know, the electricity required just to train this model. And so at the, at the level of this paper, they're saying this is a big scientific and engineering advance, but at the same time, there's a, a legitimate cost to our shared planet just to, to produce this sort of training, right? Newer data sets, C4 as an example, are even larger uh, with the maintainers uh, basically directly recommending that you more or less have to use distributed cloud servers to, to make use of them. This is not the sort of thing you're gonna do with you know, one or two computers locally. And so <clears throat> as a result, many researchers are morally concerned about the training costs required to use these techniques going forward. Remember, a lot of these advances are essentially within the last two years, and already we're seeing this you know, scaling, you know, this increase in training sizes. <clears throat> there are a number of, of concerns in general uh, to large AI. For example, there are fairness in AI concerns we may have heard about when AI was applied to, for example, hiring models or to natural language. Does it uh, treat all races and genders equally or with respect, that sort of thing. Uh, but I'm going to leave aside those fairness in AI or environmental concerns, even though they're potentially quite real, and just focus on the sort of argument that I've heard from practitioners in our community. And so here's my informal summary. We've seen that a generic model trained on a large corpus it's going to outperform last year's specialized prior research. Training sizes have been increasing dramatically even within the last two years. And then one aspect of, of our community is that modern peer review has a de facto requirement, even if it's not officially required, in practice it's required, that in order to get published, you typically have to show an improvement over some baseline, over the previous state of the art. It would be really hard to get a paper published that was 10% worse than the previous year. And because researchers need publications for a notion of impact or for tenure or for students, that's relevant. And the sort of logical conclusion of this is that less resourced researchers, maybe those from um, schools uh, with uh, you know, smaller budgets or countries that aren't, aren't devoting as much uh, you know, sort of grant money, will not be able to afford to participate in fields that are dominated by such models and that you know, genetic improvement or program repair might be becoming such a field. Um, <clears throat> and this is basically a, you know, a, a dilemma uh, because if you don't have the resources, then on the one hand, you just directly cannot afford the cloud computing training time to make a new specialized model to you know, be able to compete and be 10% better and get your paper published. And you might think, well, what if I don't? What if I just think of a good algorithm and I don't retrain it? And I use last year's model and I'm 10% worse and then I, you know, I don't get published. A lot of people can't afford to do that kind of you know, pure research for the love of the game and then not get publications. Maybe they're supporting their students or their families or that sort of thing. And so a commonly overheard concern is you know, maybe soon only big companies will be able to participate in program repair that everyone else will be driven out. In addition to training cost concerns, after you've trained the algorithm when you've applied it, there are concerns about what it can accomplish approaches that generate text based on pre-trained data are in sort of a formal sense, not suitable 
for creating new code that wasn't present in the training data. They don't have a mechanism for accomplishing it. Now, this is a nuanced claim. I want to be very careful here because they can definitely rearrange words they saw during training in a different order. And often that's going to be sufficient. For example, GPT approaches can be very good at using novel words in a sentence, even after seeing them defined only once. It's a quote from their paper. But I think a key aspect here is that once is not zero times. You do need to have seen it before. And by contrast, in program repair or improvement, a semantics-based approach like Semfix or Angelix can create wholly unseen code. For example, by solving a logical or arithmetic constraint, you might generate the code x equals five, even if there's no five in the source code because you solved a mathematical equation to arrive at five. Similarly, some template-based approaches can create previously unseen code via instantiation. This is a bit more nuanced. It relies on part of the templates to be unseen. Um, <clears throat> but the, the upshot is that program repair approaches are potentially well-positioned to produce wholly novel code. And there's sort of a, a formal sense in which a lot of these language models cannot. Right? And the impact of this is uncertain. One view is that it may not matter in practice. Coconut, you know, if it maybe it was based on these, uh, was really successful. There's a, there are some other views, though, where people have looked at um, you know, historical uh, you know, corpuses or check-ins to GitHub or that sort of thing and asked, um, <clears throat> do all of the words we need to construct new patches, are they already there in the past? Uh, and uh, one of these by Martin Mulpereau and others found that about 50% of commits are, are composed entirely of previously existing tokens. And that would put about a 50% a upper bound on the patches that could be produced by these machine learning approaches, because the others would require some, you know, new number or new variable or whatnot that wasn't previously seen. <clears throat> In addition, there are concerns about the way the problem is formulated. In natural language processing settings, the problem is often to produce text that comes next. Given these first X tokens, a prefix, what should the next Y tokens be? And there are other problem formulations like translate these X tokens from language A into language B. But this does admit a very natural sort of cast of the, the problem or the solution into program repair or improvement. It's natural, but there's a question of whether we should be using it. And informally, it goes like this. Find exactly where the bug is in your program. Delete the buggy tokens, and then give the algorithm all of the previous tokens in the program before the bug, and ask what new code should be placed right here. And this is, in some sense, isomorphic to assuming perfect fault localization, that you know exactly where the defect is, you remove the defect and say, what's the code that should go here? In practice, fault localization is a tricky problem that's studied on its own, and it's difficult in many program repair and improvement contexts. For example, some security bugs like cross-site scripting or SQL code injection aren't good fits for statistical fault localization because you visit the same line. It just varies based on the data and the payload. A lot of multi-threaded bugs aren't necessarily a good fit for fault localization models. Multi-threading is always a challenge. And there are some entire domains like Verilog circuit designs where the execution model means that you know, spectrum-based fault localization uh, in some sense doesn't apply. So how is this played out in practice? Well, the coconut paper mentioned from before uh, describes using perfect fault localization to admit a fair comparison between generate and validate techniques. That's shown on the right. Uh, this is a preferred way to evaluate GNB approaches. It enables a fair assessment of APR techniques independent of the fault localization approach used. And I, I actually think that per se, like as written, uh, that argument is quite reasonable. The issue is more that the, the sort of transitive argument, or maybe how it's, it's you know, sort of misapplied, can be trickier nuanced. And so uh, that paper says, you know, according to recent work, this is the preferred way to do it. Reference 49 there is this other paper I have listed here um, <clears throat> that uh, calls out that its, its findings about fault localization only apply to template-based tools and that approaches based on other algorithms like constraint-based tools like ACS or NOPAL were not equally sensitive. You can see this at the bottom. We, delim uh, we delimitate the validity to template-based repair tools. Other tools, constraint-based ones, wouldn't fit. And at, at least to me, um, it remains a question of whether these sort of you know, language model GPT approaches would they be impacted more or less by, by saying we're going to be using perfect fault localization? We're implicitly throwing them in with generate and validate approaches. Um, is that algorithmically justified? 
after candidate patches are produced, there's a question of how they're evaluated. And in natural language processing domains, there are a number of, of other metrics that are used commonly in the same way that maybe in software engineering would use a metric like you know statement coverage. Uh, one of these, the Rouge metric, uh, looks at um, the overlap of sequences of words between the reference answer, the gold standard, the human oracle, and the output produced by your algorithm. There's also the blue metric that uses sequence precision and often sort of a, a brevity heuristic, again, between a reference sentence and output sentences. There are other information theoretic notions like perplexity, which uh, um, relates to probability distributions and predictions, but very informally explains something like, is this word common or expected here? And it's also um, <clears throat> relatively frequent to just look for an exact match between the ground truth and uh, the answer produced by your tool. And in the domain of natural language processing, a lot of those might make sense. For example, if you're producing English text, in some sense, the only thing you can do is look at the words. You can't run or compile English text, right? It's, it's natural language. But <clears throat> even given that, Metrics like Rouge are syntactic, not semantic. Now that makes them easy to compute, but it also means they might miss information. In the natural language side, this means they, they don't handle synonyms or meaning. We're gonna see what it means for you know, software in a minute. But just as an example, and I realize all of these are sort of contrived, you can pick on any metric, but if there are two you know, sort of correct human answers for a description, like the cat is on the mat or there is a cat on the mat, if one candidate answer produced by an algorithm is there's a cat on the mat, the blue score might be 100%. But another candidate produced by an algorithm, mat the cat is on a there, also receives a blue score of 100%. The algorithm is going to think it is just as good uh, because things like structure, ordering, synonyms, meaning uh, aren't incorporated. Now, I want to be really clear. Natural language processing metrics may be entirely appropriate in many situations. For example, if you're you know, just within AI or natural language processing or whatnot, and you're comparing algorithmic advances between models, or if you're a researcher from another field, bringing your neural network to this new domain of genetic improvement, considering this problem domain for the first time, maybe you're more familiar with your NLP metrics. Or you might use it to elucidate internal algorithm behavior. And this is something we do ourselves, right? Just as we or I might measure something like the number of generations to produce a patch, as well as maybe the number of programs actually improved by patches, um, <clears throat> well, I could do that. And an end user will probably care more about the number of programs improved. But we as researchers might use information about you know, population or generation or that sort of thing to guide internal decisions or study convergence or look at how an algorithm is working. And early GenProg papers at Gecko did just that. I've got an example picture in the lower right. The danger here is that if we're not as familiar with these metrics, if we're you know, applying them in a new domain, it might be tempting to say, oh, X uses fewer generations than Y. X has a higher blue score than Y. So X is better than Y. And that doesn't necessarily follow. And so on the next slide, I'm going to give a few examples but I want to make it clear, I'm using them to be illustrative of the popularity of this evaluation approach and not as call out. So I'm not going to show the author names for these, just focus on the, the text of what people are doing. And so starting at the top, one example, since APR is analogical to the NLP task of neural machine translation, it can be evaluated with rouge and blue. Uh, in the lower left, we conduct evaluations on code repair and commit message generation. We use exact match and we also introduce the blue score. Um, in the middle, looking at figure, we can observe, blah, blah, blah. We consider the accuracy metric and then the average blue score improves by 1%. In the bottom right, beyond, besides perplexity, we consider two evaluation metrics to measure offline performance of code sequence completion, program repair, uh, Rouge and Levenstein edit distance. And I think the, the one in the upper right um, sort of really crystallizes this. It talks about a number of different metrics that they're using. It says, oh, you know, the perplexity metric measures how well a model predicts samples. Uh, you know, blue is a well-known and popular metric. It's been shown to correlate with some good stuff. And then they list another one that I think is very interesting syntactic validation. For validating the suggestions, we generate a lexer and parser, and we check to see if the resulting code parses. And this is the interesting bit, because all the previous approaches, with maybe one exception that I've been talking about, don't do this. They're not looking to see if the code compiles, much less 
if the code runs, much less if it passes the test cases. <clears throat> so can you do program repair and improvement without tests? A number of papers have reported on it. Um, and by contrast, one of the first papers to use such models, but to also consider running the resulting code against tests was the Facebook transcoder work that I mentioned earlier. That was just two years ago. And I wanna draw your attention to the bottom half of the paragraph where they say, instead, we introduce a new metric, the computational accuracy that evaluates whether the hypothesis function generates the same outputs as a reference when given the same inputs. This is testing. Does your output, you know, like the Oracle comparator model, does the output you produced compare against the, the correct answer? We introduce a new metric, testing, a new metric, 2020. <clears throat> but from the language model perspective, tests really are novel and uncommon. Remember, if a lot of these algorithms were developed for natural language processing, you can't run English in the same way that you can run Java or Python. And so, you know, this really is uh, kind of an, an out of the box uh, approach from their perspective. Uh, but from our perspective, the concern may be that a lot of the papers being published um, aren't even using syntax or compilation checks, much less testing agreement, much less something like, you know, uh, uh, satisfies invariance. So, <clears throat> What happens when you do use these tests? Well, while transcoder is, is officially a different problem, it's translation, it's not repair or improvements, this is kind of an apples to oranges comparison. When they do this, their computational accuracy is about 25 to 75%. That is what fraction of their sort of translations or patches pass the test cases. And that's a bit more like what we see from non-GPT program repair and a, a little less like the sort of you know, hype we might be hearing in the hallways. I think there's a, a relevant lens from, from sort of uh, <clears throat> criticism of science that may help us understand what's going on, at least to me. Construct validity is the appropriateness of inferences made on the basis of observations or measurements, test scores, metrics, um, <clears throat> and specifically, uh, whether a test can be considered to reflect what it's intended to do. Now, that, that may sound super abstract, but in this context, informally, this is asking us, are you measuring what you say you're measuring? For example, suppose I conduct a human study in which I show participants snippets of code and then ask them comprehension questions. I measure their times and accuracies and I start making inferences about what makes a code snippet more or less readable. That seems really tempting, but a threat associated with construct validity relates to whether I'm, I'm actually measuring purely just readability or maybe something else like complexity as well. And it's not bad to study complexity or readability, but the danger is that if, if I say I'm studying one, but my results actually relate somewhat to the other. There's an old, uh, <clears throat> an old joke that sometimes suggests that the United Kingdom and the United States are two countries divided by a common language. And we may be seeing a lot of claims in papers coming from our friends in natural language processing and AI and that suggest that approach X is better than approach Y at a program repair task. And I think that the challenge here is that better than to one group of people may mean produces token sequences yielding a higher Rouge score with respect to a reference. And to another community might mean produces more patches that pass all test cases. Similarly, program repair task to one group of people might mean given a program prefix and perfect fault localization and a large trained model, produce a patch using previously seen code. And to another group, it might mean, given a program and test cases, produce a patch that possibly uses new code. And I'm intentionally making those tasks sound you know, very different, but to some degree, that's the, the point, this miscommunication. Informally, one anxiety making the rounds in our community is that program committees or grant panels may be too inundated to, to make these distinctions or keep them in mind and may thus mistakenly conclude that a, a claim uh, in you know, an NLP or an AI paper that says you know, we're better, um, that claim is actually about better by definition one, but it may be read in our community as a claim about better with respect to definition two. Uh, and we don't want that sort of misunderstanding. So 
what do I recommend for our community going forward? Since that was a lot of, you know, sort of concerns. Now, as, as one example from our group, uh, we have looked at these sorts of, you know, encoder decoder models, many, um, many researchers, including many here have, and we evaluated a state of the art example of such a model. But in addition to considering metrics like blue and rouge, looked at a human study of 45 professionals and students. And we found that metrics like blue didn't necessarily match human intuition. In the example on the right, the human summary for a method is that this method sorts the specified range of the receiver into ascending numerical order. But the machine produced summary is sorts the receiver according to the order of the order by the. It's not necessarily bad, it does have the sorting and it does have the receiver and it mentions you know, order, but it doesn't mention specified range or ascending numerical. So it's missing a lot of the information, but it has a moderately high score by the blue metric. And we found that when we actually gave these summaries to people and asked them to complete an end-to-end -end task, like do some software engineering on this program, that participants performed better in a statistically significant manner using human written summaries versus state-of-the-art machine generated summaries. And more relevant for this discussion, that participants' performance showed no correlation with the blue or rouge uh, scores often used to assess quality of machine-generated summaries. Right? And <clears throat> this is a, this sort of this recurring theme that these may be reasonable metrics for kind of an internal algorithmic consideration, but they don't necessarily mean what practitioners in our community would expect them to mean. So if we're considering human studies, I think one challenge in comparative human studies is that if we're very excited about a new you know, AI or natural language processing or deep learning approach, there's the danger of bias if our participants can tell that. One challenge in comparative human studies is that non-anonymized presentations result in this sort of bias. One of my favorite papers on this, A Cautionary Tale, is Nikki Dell's uh, sort of classic, Yours is Better, in which she shows two actually identical artifacts, like a video player and the same video player, but claims that she wrote one of them when in fact they were, you know, sort of both exactly the same. And uh, hundreds or what of human participants said, we think yours is better, even though, again, objectively, they were exactly the same. And so one way to, to get around this is to make sure that your study is, is as anonymized as possible. And it may be worth going as far as to employ deception, not just not saying anything about a patch, but having an experimentally controlled condition in which the same candidate patches to some humans described as being written by a human and to others described as being written by a machine and sort of vice versa. And then if you collect enough uh, you know, sort of measurements or information about this in a statistical manner, you can tease apart provenance, the, the perceived author from the quality assessment. In the United States, a, an IRB approved human study involving deception typically requires a debriefing at the end where you tell people that you deceived them slightly, uh, but this is not a significant burden. An alternative approach is to employ real world end to end contexts, uh, not just, you know, do you think this patch is readable, uh, but some of the work by Martin Monperu and others on, you know, making uh, repair bots that interact directly with GitHub and file pull requests. And then if a maintainer is, is accepting a pull request, uh, in some sense, they're you know putting their money where their mouth is. That's a real rubber meets the road assessment, uh, where even if there is some sort of bias uh, you know, for tools or whatnot, um, <clears throat> that's typically not going to, to convince, um, or we believe that's typically not going to convince uh, some outside maintainer to accept a patch unless it's actually correct. In addition with human studies, I think there are additional modalities of information we can use. Eye tracking is becoming increasingly common as a kind of an add-on to human studies. One reason is that the equipment is relatively inexpensive. You can buy one of like a, you know, an eye tracking camera for about the same cost as one more computer for your lab, especially compared to medical imaging, it is quite cheap. And it can often detect where attention is being paid by a participant at the level of individual words or syntax. And that's potentially super important because we've seen that these you know, deep learning or AI or natural language processing models may produce uh, you know, out of order wordings or uh, you know, may not treat words the same way we'd expect with respect to synonyms. It also provides a validated way of assessing cognitive load via pupil dilation. I regret, I don't have time to, to go into that here, but uh, and that can be important for assessing the, you know, the difficulty or effort associated with consuming the output of a tool. We're gonna see in a bit that there's 
there's going to be an industrial focus on simplicity. And so as deep learning models produce code or text and natural language processing metrics might ignore semantics, measuring where humans pay attention becomes very, very relevant. And I'm going to claim that this practical guide to conducting eye tracking studies and software engineering in the upper right is a great place to start, and that it's not particularly difficult to go from that to, uh, you know, the next paper shows applying that during a bug fixing task, and then the third paper at the bottom shows, you know, evaluating candidate patches fairly directly with eye tracking. Another recommendation I might make would be to think about the algorithms that we're working on. In our code summarization work, we used an encoder plus a decoder plus an additional encoder for the abstract syntax tree model to incorporate program structure, not just a sequence of tokens. <clears throat> that sort of AST inclusive approach, right? That may form a natural bridge to some of the you know, prize winning grammar based GP work we've seen from uh, Bill and Justina and Mark and others, uh, many of whom are, are you know, perhaps in the audience now uh, that may uh, you know, have been quite popular a number of years ago and then might uh, you know, not have been as popular recently. There may be a resurgence for that uh, if it links up to these natural language processing approaches. I also claim that we need algorithms to take the output of these deep learning models, like something produced by GitHub Copilot, and improve it. Often it's not specialized for the relevant domain or its readability might be questionable. And it may be that a new genetic improvement like task is to improve the result of one of these deep learning approaches. We might also choose to focus on the potentially harder problems of novel synthesis, the discovery of truly new code. We could leave simple bugs that can be fixed within existing ingredients to AI approaches. That might sound a little weird, but in some sense, some of the community is already doing that. We may have, we may in some sense be leaving null pointer errors to well-deployed program repair approaches. Those may be less interesting than more complicated bugs from a research perspective. Maybe we're just seeing another step up that staircase. Finally, we might focus more on fault localization, either designing new fault localization approaches that specifically target transformer approaches, like maybe you actually want to start one token earlier than where the bug is in order to sort of give it more room to play. Uh, or dually, we might want to focus our approaches on domains, like I gave the example of, of Verilog circuit designs earlier, for which perfect fault localization is, is unreasonable. And that would allow you to write papers in which you can sort of legitimately say, we have to reject the perfect fault localization assumption. Therefore, these other approaches are uh, you know, not valid. Therefore, I don't have to pay these huge training costs. I want to conclude by mentioning some program repair deployments in industry, both to give some happy news, but also to you know, highlight some commonalities that I think might direct us in terms of impact. And from my perspective, one of the first of those that I heard was the Janus manager work uh, in 2017 for a, a smaller company, but you know, an, uh, an eye-catching title of fixing bugs in your sleep. I think a lot of us were, were really enthralled by this work at the time, focused on fixing uh, Python exceptions, but had some really strong results. And then uh, you know, the, the year after that, you know, there's the sort of the blog post and the publications and whatnot, but 2018, 2019, the uh, safe fix and get a fix approaches associated with Facebook uh, were variously applied to over 60 million lines of code. There is a lot of code at Facebook used by a lot of people, uh, mostly repairing null pointer exceptions, about half of them being accepted by devs. <clears throat> Within the last year, and this was to some degree news to me, uh, Bloomberg, a uh, finance company, uh, has also been adapting uh, or adopting automated program repair. Uh, their approach focuses on um, uninitialized variables and other templates, uh, but also shows uh, you know, about a 50% acceptance rate by developers. And then uh, at Fujitsu, they've also been deploying automated program repair. This actually came earlier, but uh, I at least, I regret, I, I wasn't as aware of it at the time, perhaps because it was positioned more as an AI approach, even though I, I tend to think of it as much more like standard automated program repair. So we might not have seen it you know, advertised in the same areas. It focuses maybe on method invocation bugs for object-oriented programming, has about a 50% accept rate, and claims that it reduces development time by about a third. Right? And so these are all uh, industrial deployments that you might you know, cite in the introduction of a paper to help motivate it, but they could also help us think about what's relevant for our work. <clears throat>
And some of the commonalities between these deployments that I've observed at least is that most of them in sort of sharp contrast to a lot of our research, focus on a single type of defect rather than trying to broadly apply to a gigantic benchmark. They might go after null pointer exceptions or object-oriented method indication errors, often via some fixed patterns that give you a lot of control over the quality of the patch being produced. And for example, uh, get a fix from Facebook, you know, it officially handles multiple types of bugs. It's true. Uh, but in the, the paper uh, of the, you know, 1,200 examples that they, they describe, 800 were null pointer exceptions. So they're, they're really focusing in on categories. Another bit that I'd like to call out is the focus on sort of readability or simplicity. Uh, Bloomberg views the readability of a fix and the future proofing of fixes as a fundamental and crucial part of the overall repair process. And to some degree, that's, um, <clears throat> I don't know if controversial is exactly the right word, but people have been considering, you know, oh, is, is correctness more important than readability? Or do I want a you know, very complicated fix that spans multiple lines or what's the right thing to be doing? And a lot of the industrial deployments that have succeeded thus far seem to favor readability, future proofing, simplicity, that kind of thing. Another very interesting bit from my perspective is that across the three big companies, Bloomberg, Facebook, and Fujitsu, the published acceptance rates are all within, you know, 3% of each other, 48, 51%. They're all basically 50%. And one potential implication of that is that when we as researchers are, are developing new algorithms, deployments in the near future may not require, you know, a 75% success rate in order to be useful. And they may favor readability and simplicity. And again, to, to some degree, this is at odds with the kind of treadmill that we see in uh, program committees, where in order to get your paper accepted, you have to be 10% better than the you know, previous year's offering. It may be that once we've hit sort of 50% uh, you know, correct patches, uh, that we should instead be focusing on things like readability. To drive home those sorts of, of conclusions with information from another source, uh, Yannick and Abek and others at Singapore uh, just recently did a survey of 100 developers asking about the acceptability of automated program repair. And they found that manual review and test cases were critical to software engineers, practitioners accepting APR. You can see there are two sort of first research questions pulled out there. And in my opinion, the emphasis on manual review really helps motivate this discussion we've been having of the use of human studies including advanced approaches like eye tracking or deception in evaluations, because it seems like for industry, human readability, right? Manual review really matters. Similarly, you can see this in, in research question two, additional test cases would have a great impact on the trustworthiness of APR. The emphasis on test cases motivates the nuanced use of extrinsic metrics in evaluations, not just rouge or blue, which can be done without even, you know, compiling or running the program. But this suggests that developers are really looking for additional bits of evidence that, you know, before this patch, I had this no pointer exception. If I apply this patch and run it, I'm going to pass all these test cases. Here's this coverage information. And that sort of domain specific semantics may be overlooked by researchers, you know, from other fields, applying novel techniques to this domain for the first time. So in summary, the application of neural network, deep learning, language models to program improvement, code completion, code summarization, program repair tasks has surged, especially within the last two years. And you may have heard of techniques or, um, <clears throat> or uh, deployments like Codex or GitHub Copilot, GPT, Transcoder. Those are all very popular examples. As popular as they are, concerns and challenges abound, especially in their application to sort of software engineering in general, but notions like program repair or improvement in particular. The training costs required to specialize these models may be exclusionary, may uh, result in a field in which a lot of, of researchers are priced out. The ability of these algorithms to synthesize truly novel code remains uncertain. And there, there's some reason to believe that current generation approaches sort of foundationally uh, cannot. They often make an assumption of perfect fault localization, and that may or may not be applicable either for the real world uh, or for certain domains. 
it may also confuse how we do evaluations between techniques. Speaking of which, a lot of the intrinsic metrics used in those evaluations, like rouge or blue, omit semantics, such as running the program, that are very important in our domain into the adoption of program repair and you know, sort of call into question what it means when various papers report success, but mean success, or mean by a success different things. Informally in the community, there's a fear that we may misinterpret results, that if enough papers say, you know, we're just 20% better, you may miss the footnote where it says by the rouge metric. At the same time, opportunities exist. There are things we could do differently. For example, how we conduct peer review. Maybe we want to be more accepting of submissions that claim algorithmic novelty, even if they don't necessarily have the empirical results, you know, even if they're not 10% better than the previous year. We may want to focus a bit more on the clarity of our communication when we're doing evaluations, what we say, what we mean by our metrics, what the problem statement is. We may want to focus more on human studies, including the use of relatively advanced techniques like eye tracking or deception in order to get a handle on how humans are interpreting the code we're producing. And <clears throat> even if it seems like these neural network deep learning approaches based on language models get sort of higher performance, I think there are a number of areas, including maybe the incorporation of successful grammar-based techniques, a focus on bugs that require truly novel code, uh, addressing the fault localization assumption, where algorithmic advances would really benefit from our domain knowledge, where we are well positioned to continue to contribute. In real world deployments and in associated surveys, we see a focus on simplicity, on humans reading patches, on tests, and on trust. And I'll conclude by suggesting that I think there's been a lot of sort of fear and uncertainty, at least that I've heard in the community, about the, the rise or the surge in these approaches. And that may have misdirected some of our recent attention to you know, competing with them you know, with respect to certain metrics away from the sorts of things that end users really care about. And I, I do think uh, that the, the sort of domain specific knowledge that we have about the structure of the problem, even something as simple as running the program on test cases uh, is really going to uh, <clears throat> position us well to contribute to program repair and improvement going forward. Thank you all for your time. <clears throat>